Throughout the duration of Camel Trophy's history, the full range of Land Rover vehicles have been challenged. From the Range Rovers and Series 3s of the early 1980s, to the Defender 90s and 110s of 88 and 89. The 1990s saw the introduction of the Discovery TDI 3-door, and later the 5-door model. Finally, in 1998, the new Freelander was used in Land Rover's final Camel Trophy year. The Land Rover Camel Trophy Partnership was a highly successful combination of great adventure and dramatic four-wheel driving. Loosely referred to as the Olympics of four-wheel driving, the first trophy, held in 1981, was a trip on the Trans-Amazonian Highway. It was undertaken by a group of Germans in Jeep CJ6s. Despite not finishing the trek, it captured the imagination of adventurers across the world. This program follows the last 10 years of Land Rover's involvement in Camel Trophy. The Land Rover, in its many guises of Defender, Discovery, and finally the Freelander, adventured its way around the world, covering over 20,000 kilometers from the heat of the Amazon to the dense jungles of Malaysia and the freezing temperatures of Mongolia and Siberia. However, by 1998, the focus had drifted away from the vehicles and towards special tasks, such as kayaking, orienteering, and mountain biking. This was to be a turning point for Land Rover. And despite the success of Tierra del Fuego and the introduction of the Freelander to the event, they decided to sever their ties with Camel Trophy and make it their last event. is where our story begins, with 14 nations taking part in Camel Trophy Amazon. The competitors expected plenty of mud, water, and serious off-road driving, and that's exactly what they got as they put their Land Rover Defender 110s through their paces as they began the 1,500-kilometer journey. The Jewel in the Jungle. The Camel Trophy's 10th anniversary lures teams from 14 nations to the Amazon Basin to struggle 1,300 miles through an event that celebrates man's sense of adventure. The competitors, all amateurs, have a once-in-a-lifetime chance to discover their limitations in what is a cross between international sport and a multinational expedition. Camel Trophy is getting more popular every year, and this year is no exception. Back in 1980, when the first Camel Trophy was run, there were 1,600 applicants or thereabouts. This year, we've had over a million applicants worldwide. And uh, when you consider that those million are actually after 28 seats, 28 places on the convoy, you can see that we can be fairly selective as to who we actually take to represent the countries. The route, covering jungle swamp and the badlands of the Brazilian gold rush, offers no refuge for the faint-hearted. The winners of the trophy emerge from 10 special tasks designed to test teamwork, driving skills, and endurance. The first day and three special tasks, a time to control pent-up nervous energy.
Amazonian Route 163 welcomes careful drivers. A single mistake here means a 50-foot drop to the floor of a washed-out road. It's hot and airless in the cab. You're cramped and caked in sour-smelling red mud. Then, the first major obstacle and the first murmurs of discontent. You know, it's better you, you just push here. You know, maybe then push. Look at yeah. this, this track here. You get your maybe you should try, the try with yeah. the... The real lesson, that it is one for all and all for one, sinks in later. The convoy presses on, sustained by dried biscuits, rice and hope. Men are numb with tiredness. They have an average of four hours sleep a night on which to cope with life's little problems. I think it's not just the physical sort of strain, it's the mental strain as well. Keep your concentration up. We're driving along roads like this for six, seven hours in darkness. It's really hard to pick out the potholes, but you, you've just got to keep your mind on it all the time. And that drains you as much as anything, I think. We thought it would be uh, a bit like this, not that muddy, but uh, we were prepared a lot of hard work. Mud, mud, inglorious mud. It waits to trap the unwise or the unwary. How many cars are sitting in the mud? Over. We're coming up on this thick, nasty bog up here, and there's about three or four cars stuck on the right-hand side. They put the wrong line. What you have to do is go to the left and really put the welly to it. You get up on two wheels, but don't worry about it. You won't go over. Me. He's stuck again. Jesus Christ, what is the f***ing matter with him? We told you to go to the right, and you went to the left, then you got excited and went to the right again. You get stuck every time, over. One thing about Will, you can always tell when he's the right side up because it's the shiny path that's at the top. Would you believe we've passed a car wash? Well, it's a Brazilian car wash, but nonetheless, it's a car wash. The Amazonian port of Santarém town everyone feared would be one broken bridge too far is within reach. A sudden sense of exhilaration, a secret sense of excitement. The bonds of friendship are strengthened by common problems as much as shared pleasures. Yet even in an event which offers a special prize for sportsmanship, man is a competitive animal. Thoughts begin to stray to the resumption of the special tasks, but it's up to the Turks to defend the trophy. Last year, Galip and Ali win the Camel Trophy, and that puts lots of pressure on us. Problems are relative. 
the Spanish team who had rebuilt their vehicle overnight following a road accident defy logic and share the lead after five tasks. heat and humidity have been beaten, but mud must have the final say. Sport, like life, is not fair. Spain's chance of winning goes with this tyre. finish, there are no losers. You can't measure a sense of personal satisfaction on a points table. Siberia played host to the 1990 event, a first for Russia and also a first for the Land Rover Discovery TDI three-door vehicle. The route would take the competitors 1,500 kilometers from Bratsk to Irkutsk. The opening ceremony was held in Moscow giving the competitors a chance to take in some of Russia's famous landmarks. We first started planning this event about 18 months ago. And from the first word, we have received help and support from the authorities, providing invaluable assistance towards this, the first major international motorsport event to be held within the Soviet Union. The competitors put Moscow behind them and concentrated on the set of special tasks designed to put the new vehicles through their paces. A little bit to the right. Yeah, back really still not on three. Okay, back. Four, three, two, one, go. Night driving became de rigueur for the teams, and the Japanese took it all in their stride, carefully following the map as they drove through sleepy Siberian villages. on the agenda is getting across this uh, stretch of water but I see in the in the river behind us there's a log raft just approaching and that moves at an incredibly slow pace so we might be delayed just a wee bit. The locally hired raft carried the teams and their discoveries downstream as they continued heading south towards their final destination. No path was unpassable as the team attacked the rough tracks outlined on their maps. And 
stay over to the right hand side, that right -hand far side. side, right hand side of the river, yeah. for about 500 meters. Okay. okay. After 500 meters, it goes very narrow, narrow. but there's some very, very fast flowing oh, water. Right. Then change to the left hand side because two cars are already stuck up there in water up to here. When driving up to a meter into the water, it's, it's impossible to see exactly where you're driving. So you need or a car in front of you, or uh, you need to walk through just like we did. A change in conditions did nothing to hamper their progress. Deep rivers and thick mud were tackled with apparent ease as everybody worked together to ensure the convoy kept on moving forward. temporary respite was offered with a smooth drive across the relatively dry Siberian plains. But this was soon over as the convoy hit deep mud and water. But the teams remained undeterred as they towed each other out of the muddy tracks and continued on their way to Irkutsk. The final set of tasks proved to be a huge challenge to some teams, but the rain and mud had to be conquered to find a winner. You're saying that all in all, eight vehicles, uh, you know, drove through this bad section of the road. But he said, uh, actually, it, he, he's saying that he's not so much surprised because uh, the first vehicles that were driving along the road had an easier time driving because the, you know, the ground here was uh, a lot harder than it is now. So it's much more difficult for the remaining vehicles to get through. of 249 points. It's Holland, the team of Holland come forward. Nineteen ninety one was the second year of competition for the Land Rover Discovery, but there was a slight difference. These vehicles were the new TDI five door models. The new vehicles were set to take on ideal trophy conditions. The relatively dry start of the journey would soon turn to miles and miles of deep mud. Camel Trophy 1991 provided the opportunity for the chosen competitors to drive through the heart of East Africa, abundant with some of Tanzania's most prized wildlife. From Dar es Salaam, the convoy traveled through the Celis Game Reserve, then up to the settlement of Mpanda and along the route taken by British explorer Dr. Livingstone. It is fair to say that during this event, a few learned that they must pay due care and attention to their vehicles at all times. Steve Ryder picks up the story. The long convoy trailed out of Dar es Salaam past an estimated half a million people. And for the teams, the amazing size and enthusiasm of the crowds lining the street en masse from the city was to make a lasting impression. Once out of the city, the first special task site tested the use of vehicle equipment, including the kilometer recording TerraTrip. The Japanese team were the first away on task one, leaving the Turks to ponder over the instructions and their training as they waited to start next. The high bank on the left, little corners, and on the right hand side there are big ones. Watch 
shot for three big holes on it right there. Right there. There's one. There's two. There's a third one right here. Here we go. Testing tracks proved not too difficult during these early stages for the Americans. The Poles, however, following a similar line, found some surprising ruts at the top of one of the first crests. This navigation and terror trip exercise is not about speed, but about covering set distances at steady average speeds, taxing nonetheless. Overenthusiasm got the better of the Yugoslavs on their country's second ever entry into the Camel Trophy. Everything is okay. Roman, Roman, okay? Okay, give your hand. Okay, take a door. Okay. Cars on their side aren't particularly unusual, pretty unusual on special tasks, actually. Um, unfortunately, a case of uh, too much haste and not enough speed. Uh, the guys are still excited, still fired up, and they're tending to panic a little bit. Um, I mean, there's no damage, there's nobody hurt. OK, done. Still with only hours of sleep to fortify them, the convoy made its way carefully through the eastern perimeter of the Cellus game reserve. Running for part of the way with the Rufiji River alongside, the wildlife reserve held precious sights for those lucky enough not to disturb the animals with the noise of the engines. Giraffe, wildebeest and gazelle were all spotted by the teams and added spice to the already adventurous start made on the event. The dry and dusty conditions on the early part of the Cellus reserve had flattered to deceive. Teams referred to it as the fall storm, as parched landscape gave way to ideal camel trophy conditions, testing all the participants' skills. Winching and towing rescue operations continued through the day as teams suddenly started to feel jaded. That, however, didn't stop them. The Japanese carried on as if driven by robot power. By now, the clay had been replaced by soil the consistency of coffee powder. Mixed with frequent showers, it became quicksand, which slowed man and machine dramatically. Progress was blunted. Three kilometers per hour was a good rate as the Germans struggled on with no center diff and no winch. The Spanish helped them, but by early evening, not only was the convoy split into two groups, but they all collectively faced another night without sleep and solid work. The teams laboriously laid sand ladders across long bogs, working until sunup, inching their way forward, as half a metre of sand tracks were laid, pulled up and laid again to take 14 vehicles across at a time. On day 11 of Camel Trophy, 23 cars set off from Mikumi by highway, the crews having enjoyed their first proper meal and sleep since Dar es Salaam. So the organisers and teams were happy with the prospect of regrouping and here were executing a safe water crossing. The sort of moment at which the unwary can be reminded that anything can happen on Camel Trophy, especially if you lose concentration just for a moment. The cheers turned to concern as Ian Chapman rushed forward to the day's crew. Luckily, it was just stitches for Marcel van Bemmel. By now, with less obstacles and the border with Burundi in sight, the mood of the convoy heightened. They are feeling so elated now. They're feeling this sense of achievement, that they're close to the goal. 
to Burundi and the final task areas. They're now starting to think more about the final uh, special task rather than the hardships that they've endured on the, on the convoy section. They're getting excited. Uh, there's a great atmosphere amongst all the teams. They've all been working together really, really well. A little bit of disappointment they haven't seen as many wild animals as they'd wanted, you know, the odd giraffe for breakfast and things. But, um, you know, there's, there's this tremendous mood in the camp now as we move uh, into Burundi. In the knowledge that it was the penultimate task, teams really worked their Land Rover discoveries hard. But of course, for those at the top of the competition table, Austria, United Kingdom, Turkey and France, it was to prove a tense final few hours. Having been on convoy together with just the jungle and animals for company, teams were playing out the final act in front of an appreciative media audience, and some just played to the cameras. Others were simply showing off. The French managed to fly with style and keep up their fight in the competition section. The British team of Street and Dre were fighting for first place in the Camel Trophy competition section, but they completed the task too quickly. The Austrians, they scaled the mountainous logs with a calculated indifference. But the big award for the amalgamation of all the points was still to come. The winner of Camel Trophy 1991 and the team spirit vote. The team from yeah. Turkey! Nineteen. The French, who begin last, have a lead to protect. Their consistency is rewarded with the title of Special Tasks Winners in... Eighteen nations formed this year's convoy, with South Africa present for the first time. Spirits were high, as this year's competitors worked together to dig each other out of the mud. From El Dorado, the team would head west, out of the thick jungle and across the wet swamplands of Paraguay, back into Argentina for day after day of driving on the dry Chaco plains, over the Andes and into the Atacama Desert, and the finish on the Pacific coast of Chile. 18 days, three countries, and 2,500 kilometers. Let's pick up the action. The tracks the far side were as waterlogged as the piranha, only the fish were missing. The locals call this the road to hell, except hell is cooler than central Paraguay. With every meter, the mud got wetter. Puddles became ponds, ponds became lakes. The road became a sea of mud. If it was the last thing they did, the teams were there to get through the mire. The sight of cattle on the road made the task seem easier, but cows and gauchos are about the only things that dare tackle the road to hell. For five months of the year, no wheeled vehicles even venture near the place. It didn't take the teams long to work out why. The road to hell turned from bumpy to a wet roller coaster ride. The discoveries bucked and kicked like the local cattle. Their drivers held on like the gauchos for dear life. Below the surface of the water, Deep ruts sank up to three feet deep. The front of the discoveries disappeared underwater like boats in a storm. Some holes got too deep even for the discoveries. With eternal optimism, the teams got out of the vehicles and got stuck into digging the ruts out of the road. In three hours, the convoy only crept forward 300 meters. Yeah, certainly at the start of the convoy this morning, we were expecting a bit of trouble. This is the first major obstacle, a lot of mud, soft sand, water. Long haul through us over here now. If, uh, no, none, none of the convoys through yet. We've got to prepare the road. It's going to be a difficult one, but we'll get through. The spirit is very good. The guys are 
ready. They're working hard, digging hard. As you can see, they've already done a lot of work digging and preparing the road. And the guys are enjoying it thoroughly. <gasps> this is not nice. The convoy split into work groups, getting one vehicle through each obstacle at a time. Those up front had to deal with virgin mud. Those behind had to deal with the holes made bigger by the cars ahead. At one point, the convoy stretched out for 10 miles. From 18 separate units, the convoy gelled into one team of workers. The sun baked the mud hard onto their skin and clothes and made the bodywork of the discoveries hot enough to cook on. Still relatively fresh after only four days on the road, the teams were fighting fit and insanely keen to overcome the sea of mud and water. The mud had been a backbreaker. Now the challenge was the Chaco, the endless prairies in Argentina's far northwest. The convoy made good time across the Chaco, travelling the farthest distance in one day since the 1992 Camel Trophy. At the end of the 18-hour day, the convoy fought through bushes long and sharp enough to rip a tyre, just to find a campsite on the banks of the River Pasaje. For a week, the sole objective of the Camel Trophy was to cross the Andes, stopping only for two days to build a mountain research center near Peogasta. Climbing thousands of meters a day, the convoy snaked into South America's wildest mountains. With every meter climbed, the air got thinner and cooler, the engines hotter and wearier. A week ago, the route was bogged with mud. Now there wasn't water enough to keep much alive. Only cacti and prickly grasses survived this high. Because we've been uh, climbing so high, the vehicles have been working extra hard and consequently they're overheating. And with the advice is run the heaters on, although it's still very hot here, keep the heaters on, the windows open and uh, take it steady with the vehicles. And watch the temperature gauge. I've never seen anything like this before. Uh, mountaineering is my hobby and I spend a lot of time in the mountains, but this is just absolutely amazing. And the best is yet to come. I mean, we're still climbing higher and higher. I'm wondering when the road is going to end. We're still going up and up. It's great. It's a world on top of the world, a place where only the toughest survive and where the brave dare tread, perfect for camel trophy. Between the Andes and the ocean is the Atacama, the world's driest desert. For hundreds of miles, there's no vegetation, just sand and rock. It took two days to come down off the mountains into Atacama. Every meter closer to the sea, the air warmed up and the oxygen got thicker. In the heart of the desert, the heat was fierce and the dust heavy. At the back of the convoy, the teams were driving blind in a fog of bulldust, so thick that the Canary Islanders almost drove off the edge of a cliff. In teams of six discoveries, the drivers headed for their invisible coordinates in the desert. A marshal in one of the cars was meant to observe the navigation challenge and tell the teams when they had found the right spots. The groups crisscrossed the Atacama all day, driving up and down dunes, trying to find a way across gullies, just to get the elusive map coordinates. One group took three hours to find the first point, going round and round the same dune to find a way to the top. Anyone taking a shortcut ended up stuck in a gully or up to the axles in soft sand.
Not all teams agreed on how to navigate. The Swiss, who were still leading after El Dorado, had a big falling out. The Italians also. Only one group managed to get all their GPS points in the right order. The Canary Islanders even got stuck in a hole and waved their group away, thinking that they could get out on their own. But this task was not about driving fast. The idea was about working as a unit. Even for the best teams, finding the coordinates was not easy. The last 50 kilometers of the two and a half thousand across South America looked more like a desert caravan than the world's toughest four-wheel drive adventure. There was no avoiding the bull dust this time on the final sweep through the Atacama, down onto the beach at Juanitos. For the first time in three weeks, the Camel Trophy could go no further. Well, it was great coming through to, to the final uh, end line. Uh, it was a fantastic feeling having to achieve the, the, the objectives of the Camel Trophy now. But uh, yeah, all good things must come to an end and it happens too quickly, but uh, it's been a fantastic experience and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it from start to finish. No regrets whatsoever. And uh, the experiences obtained were, you know, indescribable, it's really fantastic. Victory this year went to Spain. Congratulations. <laughs> Central America, home of the ancient Maya, Belize, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador and Honduras through five nations over three weeks covering 2,000 kilometers. 20 teams volunteered to endure Camel Trophy Mundo Maya 95. This year the mud and water literally swamped the vehicles as competitors towed and dug each other's Land Rover discoveries out of the mud. David de Kaiser continues. The convoy is heading for the frontier between Belize and Mexico the second of the five nations on the mammoth circumnavigation of the Mayan world. Never before has Camel Trophy crossed so many borders. Only one track leads out of the jungle. If it had rained, the mud would have been impassable. If there had been mud, Camel Trophy Mundo Maya might have spent two weeks on the same track. Small pits of black mud sent a few wheels spinning, but the train kept on rolling. By nightfall, the teams have an appointment with Lake Petanitsa, last stronghold of the Maya. On the banks of the lake, the teams make the best camp of the expedition. Normally on Camel Trophy, the convoy runs as a whole, often up to three kilometers long, each car looking out for the next. In Guatemala, that all changes. Spread out like pathfinders discovering a new land, the teams unfurl Guatemala for themselves. 750 kilometers separate the Peten and the Guatemalan border with El Salvador, where the convoy has plans to regroup. 750 kilometers in two days. Sleep is kept short. Up over the mountains of Western Guatemala, where some of the world's best coffee is grown, the teams see the country warts and all. At the river Ostua, where Guatemala and El Salvador meet, the teams safely came together again. The Belgians had come close to crashing, but everyone else was safe. The dream of a final week waist deep in mud looked to be coming true. But the reality of life on the road was a little more down to earth. A herd of cattle brought the convoy to a standstill. 
The rain swelled the rivers on the border between El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras, turning stream into torrent. Under the surface, huge boulders littered the riverbed. One wrong turn and a discovery could be left floundering in midstream. One at a time, following precisely in each other's wheel tracks, the convoy inched its way across the river. A railway bridge marks the border between Honduras and Guatemala. Its wooden deck is broken and is only a few inches wider than the vehicles. The bridge is an impressive structure, but nothing compared with the rock roadway the Spanish explorer Cortes built through Central America. The convoy is the first motorized expedition to follow Cortes' route from Honduras into Guatemala. The locals take bets that it won't succeed. Gangs of team members gnaw away at the undergrowth and the deep ruts on Spanish Road, gradually clearing away along the historic trail. It takes an hour to edge forward one kilometer. Every hole has to be filled, every dead tree moved clear. The goal is to be free of the jungle by dusk. The team step up a gear. One rut is too deep to fill, too wide to bridge. The Israeli car is its first victim. Even with the trail cleared, the jungle swallows cars and their drivers whole. Convoy. To them, the impossible had just been achieved. Guatemala seems never-ending, up the entire length of its long eastern borders, where roads are rare and where bandits roam. The convoy has 500 miles of motoring before crossing back to Belize. On their own again for two days, the teams make a break for Belize. The road north takes the teams back into the Patan. Deep in the jungle, just into Belize, the tracks turn to mire. In three weeks on the road, the teams have almost forgotten the living hell of the special tasks back at Lamanai. The highs and the lows of life on the road erase the memories of the competition. In a task not unlike one at Lamanai, the Germans get to bend a few more panels on their Land Rover discovery. The race at the top of the leaderboard is now between the South Africans, the Greeks, the Poles, and the Camel Trophy newcomers, the Czech Republic. All overs and Antonich, the tasks continue. The finale is a battle of brawn. Only the strongest team will win. For the four countries still in with a chance of clinching the special task award, being on the winning side is crucial. As chance would have it, two are on one team and two on the other. The first group have no trouble heaving their discovery over the rapids. The others are caught on a rock. Victory is floating away. Finally, the second vehicle springs free, only to get caught up with the first, which has sunk in 10 feet of water. In an extraordinary show of team spirit, all the teams join together to free the first car. It looks like a fish tank and now weighs over four tons. Every man and woman is needed to shift it.
The leading team get their discovery to within inches of the finish line and leave it there. Instead, rushing back to help the other group dislodge their stricken discovery. It's a dead heat. Both teams score equal points. We're glad it's all over, but it's been tough. But on the other hand, it's, it's a shame it's all over, because we're all going to be going back to our own countries. I don't know if we'll be seeing any more of us, of each other's. And I don't know, it's, it's sad in a way that it's all over. The winners of the Camel Trophy, Mundamaya 1995, is the team from the Czech Republic. That really is an amazing double for the Czech Republic. That is their first time on the event. They've come straight in and they are overall winners. It's Denik Lametz, Marek Machedl. Dawn broke on the morning of April the 1st, 1996. Tension mounted. The 20 teams and support crews made the final preparations to the 38 Land Rover Discoveries and Defender 110s before embarking on the historic 1,850 kilometer journey through the heartland of Southern Borneo. Let's go straight to the action. Eighty kilometers northwest of Balikpapan, the teams begin the first of the special tasks. These are the competitive elements of Camel Trophy, each designed to test the participants' stamina, mental ability, navigation and 4x4 driving skills. Yeah, I think you've got to relax a bit. And, uh, you know, it's good to win the competition, but you keep in the vehicle for the next three weeks there's no more crash on day one. Oh. Ah. The only thing we've broken is the exhaust, so I'm very pleased that there's no other serious damage. Obviously, it's not a good idea to punish the car. <laughs> but, you know, when you get into a task, it suddenly goes out the window that you, know, you want to do well. Hard work. How does it look on the other side? The first major river crossing was a big test. Muhu Balusu over the Sungai Jalau. Event coordinator Mark Day gave advice to the teams. Why don't we just winch it backwards? We're going to build this road this side with sand track. We're going to build the road over there with sand track. We're going to drive straight on and straight off, OK? At first, they struggled to work as a cohesive unit. But eventually, working into the night using a local pontoon, the teams managed to get 38 vehicles across the Swollen River in 12 hours. Startled locals, who hadn't seen vehicles for a long time, gazed in wonder at the convoy. We first find a little bridge and we cross over, but we try to go through the water, but the water, the, the, this little lake is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and there is a big hole over there and all the cars are getting the nose underneath. So it's going to be, a, we will take very long to go through here. <laughs> Driving, winching and snatching their vehicles over obstacles, the convoy endeavored to push on to their final destination. Oh, what? 
Oh, it's top. Couldn't be better. Nice little uh, swimming pool to wade our way through. <laughs> the experience gained over the past few weeks could be seen by the slick manoeuvre of the UK car through another river. The teams were still cheerful, but aware that they were falling behind schedule. Rolling, 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 keep the convoy going. Rolling, 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 roll on. The convoy overcame the last few mud holes, washouts and flooded rivers before the track improved and they began their final push towards Pontiana. After 20 days, tiredness was really taking its toll and the German and Japanese vehicles went over on their sides. The red clay tracks were lined by thousands of cheering children. Families gathered in fascinated groups to view the bizarre spectacle. The convoy passed under the shadow of Gunung Batadea, a 2,000 foot high volcanic limestone plug which rose dramatically from the flat landscape. A significant moment. It meant they were getting close to their destination. The teams arrived at Pantai Gosong, just north of Pontianak, unbelievably only 24 hours behind schedule. The final set of special tasks, which included vehicle maneuverability, teamwork and physical fitness, ended with a spectacular group canoeing task which signalled the end of Camel Trophy Kalimantan, 1996. It was a remarkable event. They had overcome all kinds of obstacles in all types of weather conditions and had made it across Kalimantan. They started as 20 teams and finished as one. It was an adventure they would never forget. Winners of the Special Task Award, the team from Russia. Winners of this year's Team Spirit Award, voted by everybody on the convoy, is the team from South Africa. And the winners of the new Land Rover Award for driving in special tasks and the overall winners of Camel Trophy 1996, the team from Greece. Mongolia is a vast landlocked country, three times the size of France. The route took the competitors from the capital, Ulaanbaatar, up to the border with Siberia and down into the Gobi Desert, before returning via Karakoram, a journey of 2,500 kilometers. This year saw a change to the traditional event. Extra disciplines such as mountain biking, kayaking and orienteering were added to the competition, moving the focus away from the vehicle. The rain, which has fallen during the opening ceremony, gradually disappears as the teams pick up speed. Their destination, an ancient gathering point for the Mongolian people, a sacred spot whose history is lost in the mists of time, Turtle Rock. Behind the celebrations, each competitor knows how tough conditions will be. The beauty of Mongolia is unforgiving to the unprepared. The opening section of the competitor's journey takes them out onto the vast steppes, rolling grasslands which reach to the horizon. On the way, they attract many curious glances from Mongolians unused to such colourful machinery passing by. Luckily for the competitors, many of them know how to read a map. 
That's about one. Once they've been pointed in the right direction, they can be on their way. There's more to Camel Trophy than driving. Mountain biking is just one of the new competitions for 97, and one which the difficult terrain of Mongolia is ideally suited for. The hills and woodland provide a real challenge to even the fittest, and already a few of the competitors are finding the going a little tougher than they'd imagined. No sooner has one competition ended than a new one begins, this time kayaking on the rocky white water streams filled with freezing mountain waters. More exercise for the lungs comes with orienteering, for many of the teams rated the hardest of all the competitions because of the mixture of exercise coupled with concentration. The technical driving test involves negotiating a difficult course of tight turns and steep slopes whilst avoiding picking up any penalties. Two teams are about to find out that too much haste can lead to costly errors. It's tempting to put your foot down on the accelerator, but not a good idea. Yeah, priority guys, listen in. Nick, they're both OK, are they? You drive very fast and uh, left turn and uh, yeah. see down the hill, see. Are you OK? okay. Oh, yeah, only running can show him the way. Forewarned should have been forearmed, but taking an even bigger tumble, the Greek team follow the Russians. It's soon time to move on, though. With so much distance to cover, the days pass quickly. Time isn't the most important thing. The Land Rover Award involves getting from one point of the map to another, choosing the best available route. That means matching the distance set by Mark Day, the route coordinator. How are you doing? Fine. Fine. Whoa, not bad. Now, this, the aim of this exercise is basically to match the ideal distance set by event management. At the end of the Land Rover Award, it's all about who has got the ideal distance. What have you got? 154.53. Hey. Top cool, boys. Top cool. The changing terrain is fun to drive through and tests both the wheel clearance and windscreen wipers of the competitors' vehicles. For much of their day, the vehicles are driving through a barren landscape, with few signs of others passing before them, except ovus, shrines ensuring good luck situated on the top of mountain passes. No matter how dry some areas of the country are, in the wet, the teams find they often have to help each other out of some difficult situations. They soon learn that the winches on the front of their Land Rover discoveries have a practical purpose. Even so, sometimes it's a case of everyone lending a hand. The Mongolians often seem to drive by every bit of trouble. For hours on end, the teams journey through the Mongolian landscape. 
sometimes peering out through windscreens covered with melting snowflakes, sometimes choosing the best line to take through swollen rivers. One place where the weather can be guaranteed hot and sunny is the Gobi Desert. Home to many rare and exotic species, the Gobi has long been used as a shorthand phrase for the unknown. The teams know they are three quarters of the way through their journey, yet they can't afford to relax their efforts. In this flat and barren wasteland, they need to concentrate harder than ever on their route, relying on their onboard global positioning system and old-fashioned map reading skills. The results of the Land Rover Award are announced when the teams arrive at the competition site, and it's Romania's turn to enjoy being the centre of attention. For the team from Romania. The driving competition isn't over though, and in the Gobi, the teams have to make sure they find exact points in the desert, hundreds of yards apart. Swerving between flags without touching them isn't easy when you're trying to make time. The competition also makes sure that both team members get a chance to drive. and the competitors have to follow all the rules, such as making sure they have their seatbelts on at all times. It was the Austrian pair of Stefan Oyer and Albrecht Toising who took Camel Trophy Mongolia 97. The secret of success? Relaxing, take it easy, no mistakes, good points. Yeah. We won it. <laughs> Nineteen ninety eight was the last year of Land Rover's involvement in the trophy. The competition had become diluted, and the focus on four wheel driving was not so much a major part of the competition as in previous years. The twenty teams will rely on their new freelanders to take them over five thousand kilometers from Santiago, the capital of Chile, down to Ushuaia, Argentina, the most southerly city in the world. Ahead of them lies three weeks of adventure. The snow-covered mountains towering above Santiago provide the venue for the official start. The 37 yellow freelanders join together to form an international convoy up to the ski resort of Valle Nevado. The rules of Camel Trophy this year that you drive to a discovery location using the vehicle and the GPS. And once you're there, you then use one of the four disciplines to get onto the adventure locations. We spin it until it interlocks. And you'll get a code. Good, so we can prove that we, we've been here. This score is 10 points. This year, Camel Trophy is a mental challenge as well as a physical challenge. As the morning mist lifted, the first day of Camel Trophy got Ooh. underway. This year, each team has two vehicles. The team's freelander is followed by the Defender 110, which carries all the equipment. Chile and Argentina boast some of the most breathtaking scenery in the world. It's a spectacular location for the first snow and ice Camel Trophy. Where better to test out the freelander and introduce Andean sports? Yes, I guess we're coming close, Memo. You hear the waterfall? Yeah, we got it. Here we are, Team Turkey, yeah? This may seem an obscure place to look for a discovery point. But en route from Santiago to Ushuaia, there are 224 plates hidden on anything from rocks and trees to shipwrecks. It takes teamwork and good navigational skills to find them. The 
landscape in stage two is stunning. It is also anything but predictable. The sub-zero temperatures and thick snow enhance the scenery, but they do nothing to help the competitors. Undeterred, the Camel Trophy teams will overcome any obstacles thrown in their path. Along the way, the competitors take time out to enjoy what nature has to offer. So far, the teams have driven through a kaleidoscope of landscapes, from volcanoes and glaciers to pampas and waterfalls. Now the pull of the Atlantic Ocean is too much for some to ignore. At this stage, the teams have already driven halfway to Ushuaia. <laughs> Snow is too high over there, so there is no chance we will we'll go through it in the sea. Sure. You pull the red chain through. Oh, no. See, it, it closes by itself. Oh, really? Yeah. 